but uh, our next speaker, uh, who is going to talk about uh, what he calls the new railroad, um, is State Comptroller Kevin Lembo. Uh, Kevin is someone who is a friend of the region, uh, who has been here before, spent a lot of time here, um, has an amazing knack for speaking to uh, audiences of Republicans and Democrats. I've watched it a couple of times. Uh, Republican and Democratic chief elected officials, which are uh, the boards that make up the COGS, and he almost leaves them, uh, you know, linking arms and singing in Kumbaya. They, they, he really speaks to the issues of uh, fiscal constraint and common sense um, and building consensus around these issues of, of finance and uh, government operations. So I, I would like to bring uh, Kevin up now. Um, he knows something about... Uh, Gigabit technology, it's a, also one of the items that is near and dear to him and something that's very important to us in uh, trying to build an advanced manufacturing corridor. So, uh, Kevin, if you would, uh, your state comptroller and a good friend of the Naugatuck Valley region, uh, Kevin Lembo. Thank you, Kevin. Good afternoon. Rick, thank you. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, these lights are a little unnerving because I can't see you and I don't know when I'm losing you or when you're with me, so uh, I'll apologize in advance. Um, I, I get excited sort of sitting there in the dark uh, with you listening to sort of what the possibilities are. Uh, I was with uh, Joe McGee yesterday for a little while and I told him a story that when I had my office in Albany many, many years ago now, uh, on the wall of the office that I inherited, there was an artist's rendering of uh, the Grumman Maglev sort of train project that was going to connect Albany to New York City in sort of record time. And it was sort of faded and chipped and broken. But I left it there just as a, uh, a reminder uh, that there are good ideas in each of these conversations. There are good ideas in each generation of thinkers that come along and often we build on one another. Um, but at some point, we're actually going to get one of these big things really done, done. Um, and I hope uh, that most of us get to ride the rail or do the thing uh, that we've been talking about. Um, it's going to take uh, some, some discipline. It's going to take some uh, greater constraint on the part of government to pull back in some areas so we have the resources to do what we need to do in the others. Uh, but it is all doable. Um, I'm looking for uh, that moment of consensus and collaboration that I think we've lacked in Connecticut for quite some time. Uh, I'm looking for uh, a man on the moon moment for us uh, as a, a small state where we can come together across party line and make a decision that this thing, whatever that thing is, um, is something we can agree on and we know it's going to lead us to a better place if we could all uh, get behind it. So. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different uh, tact on things today um, and draw some parallels uh, between your rail conversation and your road conversation and something else that I think we've begun to think about uh, but need to think about more, and that's how to bring high-speed uh, internet service, fiber optic, broadband uh, to every business and residence uh, in the state of Connecticut. I uh, got a little nod to the Nogtuck train yard here. Um, I didn't find the picture myself, but I'll thank my staff uh, for finding that. Uh, but that's sort of when you think about uh, the history of all of this, um, you know, there was a, a growing capacity in the Naugatuck Valley to do important things, and then there was water, and then there was innovation, and people were growing families, and multi-generations were there and ready, um, and they needed to connect uh, to markets, and they needed to connect to one another, um, and so we're at a, a very similar place uh, now in that um, we've got a lot of good things going on. And it's possible, and I don't want to sound like Pollyanna in all of this, but it's possible to sort of look at the negative news all the time and say, oh gosh, how are we ever, are we ever, it's impossible, let's just give up. But, but those are the moments where we can't give up. That, that idea that when you're on your hands and knees after a fall is just the moment to think about how did I get here and how do I prevent this from happening again? Well, we're literally on our hands and knees, right? We're trying to think about what just happened? What does this economic downturn look like? How do we sort of launch ourselves into this next great moment? So we're at that critical moment again, um, and infrastructure um, cannot be 
uh, under-discussed. Um, it can't be undervalued as the piece of all of this uh, that demands our attention. I'll go as far as to say that um, even though we get very excited when uh, economic and community development grants go out and businesses get a small or large bit of money or taxes foregone, um, that's all fine and good. Uh, but that's not a never-ending supply of credits or cash. You know, at some point you hit the bottom of that. And it really doesn't play to our strengths as, in this case, a state government because, you know, I'm not very good at picking winners and losers in the marketplace. Frankly, if I was, I wouldn't be standing here today. I'd probably be on some warm island somewhere. Um, government's just not built to do that. So when we engage in that, um, yeah, it feels good in the short run, uh, but then you get down to you know, picking one pizza joint over another and dedicating resources to that stuff. I think in bad economic times, um, when markets are failing and cash is drying up, absolutely it's government's role to sort of roll in there and try to keep everything sort of moving, keep the gears lubricated so that when the recovery uh, occurs, you can really take flight and you're not just trying to get those seized up uh, engines moving again. But once economic recovery begins, then we need to pull back and start to think about what is our real role here? And our role is to make sure that, certainly on the regulatory side, certainly on the tax structure side, but definitely on the infrastructure side, we're doing what we arguably do best of all of that, and that's these large-scale uh, public uh, projects. But it's got to be both responsive to a real need and not one uh, that's just made up. We've got to use real data to drive our way. Um, we've got to be responsible, and there's got to be scale to some of this. Um, and we've got to think not about the 20 minutes into the future, uh, but well beyond that. And that's uh, also something that I think government uh, hasn't proven very good at doing as of late. Uh, so when we talk about road and we talk about rail and we talk about air and we talk about ports, um, you know, we're often talking about moving people and stuff, right? We want to get people, people to people, people to jobs, people to wherever they want to go. We're talking about raw materials to fabricators, fabricators to refiners. It's going like all stuff's got to move, products got to get to market and we need to get it there one way or another. But we don't talk as much about the importance of these information packets, these millions and billions and trillions of rows of data that move every day. Um, and we need to figure out how we're going uh, to do that as well. Um, so uh, this is uh, probably more than we need, but uh, the new economy depends on that connectivity. So uh, a quick story, um, my office is at 55 Elm Street in Hartford, which is the, I think they used to call it the Little Etna building. It's down at the bottom of Bushnell Park on the circle. Um, and I would argue that because of the job that I have, I've got a little bit of sway at the Capitol to get things done and um, not much, just, just a little. Um, and we needed fiber to 55 Elm. I'm moving millions of rows of financial data, healthcare data every day. It took me one year, one year, to get fiber into the building from the closest hub. That's me. So if I'm the travelers and I want the fiber and they've got it, you know, I just go out and I finance it and I do it and I bring it from the hub and I bring it to where I am. Um, if I am a nonprofit, sort of I'm out. And if I'm an entrepreneur, a young sort of scraggly kid that we've just graduated with an MBA or an M something out of one of our great institutions of higher education, they come out with these ideas that are meant to save our economic lives. They come out ready to do something. They get used to the great connectivity that they have within the walls of the ivory tower in which they've been educated. And then they come out and they're sharing an apartment with three other people, maybe within striking distance of the campus, and they plug in and they simply can't transact the business. They can't collaborate with their colleagues, whether they're around the block or around the world. Well, that's a missed opportunity. But that drive to do that thing uh, doesn't go away just because the speeds and the capacity fails. That drive then gets transplanted from wherever they are to wherever they need to go to get that thing done. So you watch this draining of creativity sort of I don't know if you can drain up, but drain up into sort of Cambridge, right? When um, 
when Pfizer took their R&D capacity you know, out to, to Cambridge, they called many of us, and uh, I got a call as well before they announced it, and I asked what I think everyone asked, and that was, what could we have done differently? You know, what could we do to, and what can you do? The answer is nothing now, because Cambridge figured out 10 years ago what they needed to do to build the infrastructure and create that creative, collaborative environment, um, and that's where we need to be. Now, I'm sure there's a bunch of other reasons as well, but that was the stated reason, at least the stated reason to me. But so what do we do now? Do we cocoon? Do we sort of roll ourselves up in grandma's afghan and say, oh, well, it's all over? Or do we figure out, okay, well, another 10 years, there's going to be another one of these. We want to be on the receiving end. What do we need to do? Uh, so the Connecticut Gig Project um, came about because uh, Ellen Katz, who's the State Consumer Council, Senator Beth By in West Hartford, and myself, uh, Deputy Mayor Sherry Cantor in West Hartford, um, Mayor uh, Martin in Stamford, and Mayor Harp, uh, who was Senator Harp and now is Mayor Harp of New Haven, um, all were talking about this, but talking about it separately, and it all sort of came together one day, and we realized we need to sort of figure this out. And there, there's a role for government, even on a, from a planning perspective, in all of this. And it's got a couple of guiding principles, um, and obviously we want to bring uh, uh, high-speed uh, internet to every home and business, uh, but because of the way Connecticut law is written, because of home rule, dare I say, because of a whole bunch of things, it's really a municipally driven uh, process. Uh, the effort is really coming out of the municipalities. And that's good, I think, because it's a reflection of the on-the-ground reality. If you pulled up and looked at a map of Connecticut and looked at, for example, where fiber was, either lit fiber or dark fiber around the state, um, you can see that it's probably where you would expect, at least in any concentration. It's not in places where the ROI on that build-out isn't there, and that's also to be expected under the existing model. Um, but each of those geographic locations likely has a different uh, both existing infrastructure issue as well as a path forward from their neighbors. You know, that sort of Salisbury is going to be different than Stamford um, and Guilford from Groton and New Haven from wherever. Uh, so whatever the solution is going to be, the guiding principle is access for all. Um, and then on top of that, how do you get there? So the existing providers in the space um, had a little bit of a, a, a freak out moment. Um, and you hear this at the Capitol a lot. You'll often hear whenever we get involved in these kinds of conversations, like government's got no role here, just go away. And I sort of believe that if the underlying market is actually working. But when it's monopolistic or duopolistic and there's no competition on price and quality, then it's not a market, it's something else. And we need to figure out what do we do to blow this open a little bit more to introduce uh, more uh, uh, competition on, on cost and quality. Um, the, um, we suffer from a number of things. The uh, Consumer Council put out a report uh, yesterday. Um, I'm only halfway through, but I will get through it. Uh, but it's proving sort of what we, we already know, and that's, as I've already said, depending on where you are, you can have a real issue. The idea that um, on Farmington Avenue, in the shadow of the big insurers, there is an incubator space uh, sitting right on Farmington Avenue across the parking lot from, uh, from the big insurers. Um, and it's made up of a bunch of people who've been sort of retired out of or been sort of downsized, right-sized out of uh, some of the, the companies, but they have sort of ideas about this and feel they have productivity left in them, so they're coming together to figure out how do we feed off each other and figure out where we're going to go from here. Um, they, they needed high-speed internet. They needed, you know, a gig in their building. They needed fiber. Um, it is literally in the street on Farmington Avenue across from where they are. And the cost to them to bring it to the building was $30,000, which when you're in an incubator space, this is probably a little bit more than you can realize. So this sometimes doesn't, be, this often doesn't become a problem for big companies. It's really, again, those uh, others that are working on the next thing, not the last thing um, that are running uh, in, into problems. And we all know we've got issues with our phone company, cable company, you know, confidences. I can't tell you how many times I'm on the phone screaming at my carrier who will remain nameless. Um, 
So those are the goals. Uh, you're not going to be surprised by them. They are about competition. They are about economic development. And they are about talking about broadband, talking about fiber in the same conversations that we talk about rail and road and ports and planes. I'm convinced um, that without this, no matter what, uh, there will be lots of winners in a state like Connecticut. I think New Haven wins, Stanford wins, I think Hartford maybe wins, maybe New London, we'll see. Um, there, there are some winners. But that same migration of those smart young people, it's not just to Cambridge, it's not just to New York, but they're flowing down Route 8 into the urban center. They're flowing down into New Haven out of the midpoints between Hartford and New Haven. So when you're a municipal leader and you're trying to figure out what does my tax base look like? Where are people working? As more people are working at home, why don't they just work here? Well, then it's even more important for those small and medium-sized communities uh, to be able to, uh, to engage in this and have access for their folks. Um, so I'm going to apologize already because this is dated from four days ago when I signed off on the last one um, in that the average speed now I'm told is 11.9 as of this morning in the most recent report that's out and that changes that to nearly 100 times uh, faster than what is out there uh, now. Communities that have done this and have done it successfully have done very well. Uh, there are some. And the example of Chattanooga in particular is one that, you know, it's possible to overstate the role that the gig had in uh, Chattanooga's success. Uh, but anyone was to ch who has been to Chattanooga before and after will see and feel the difference. Um, and they are at a point now where uh, they're talking about ways to extend their fiber to the surrounding communities beyond them because there, there's such saturation in certain parts uh, of that community. Uh, a happy problem uh, by any uh, definition. And they are attracting these data-reliant businesses that are the sweet spot for Connecticut. So when I go to the legislature and I say, you should consider doing this thing, no matter what it is, here's the background, here's the data to support it, here's where I think this is gonna lead us, probably wanna take a couple of immediate steps to do that. Sometimes you get a good reaction, sometimes you don't. But as soon as I say you're behind Tennessee, then you've got their attention. So right now we're behind Chattanooga, uh, we are Connecticut. We're about the size of what? Orange County, California. We're not that big. We got a lot of sort of challenges, but we have a lot of amazing strengths uh, as well. Uh, I'm incredibly bullish on this place, uh, despite all the challenges that we read about every day in the paper. So uh, business are, are demanding. Um, they need it. They've been at the Capitol. Jackson Labs, um, I think, is a, an important example. Um, and I'm always surprised that folks haven't heard this story, but I think it's, it's important for us to take it on. Um, Jackson Labs, you know the deal. There was a deal made with Connecticut. In my view, based on our strengths, it was probably a really good deal. That biotech sort of that is really one of our strengths. And then they set up temporary housing in Farmington while they were building their building. They work on genomic, you know, healthcare and personalized medicine. And they began transmitting a genomic file from Farmington to their headquarters in Maine. And at the speed that it was moving through the existing tubes, and I use that word intentionally, it was going to take two weeks for that data file to move from point A to point B. So if we think about what we've done, we have the right employer, the right solution based on the right strengths, putting down roots in a place with infertile soil because we weren't ready for them. Now for them, it was okay because they were able to use their resources to pull fiber from the nearest hub, get it to the building and resolve that. But again, that's not the only piece of the economy that we need to be uh, paying attention to. So um, if anyone uh, wants more information about this, the Consumer Council is really leading the statewide municipally driven conversation um, uh, about this issue, um, getting businesses and residents sort of dialed in uh, to what's happening and try to gauge uh, their uh, desire to participate. Uh, take inventory of the assets that you already have. Um, I was really surprised that um, Norwich, as an example, uh, has so much dark fiber already in their community because of the presence of their municipal utility that they've been sort of pulling fiber all this time, kind of quietly. It's there and ready to light up. That's going to be different than other communities. Uh, and as I said earlier, is going to need uh, a municipality by municipality uh, look. Um, and it, 
we also need to pressure state government, and I would argue not before the budget uh, amendments are <laughs> delivered next week, because um, the timing would be really bad, a little tone deaf, but we need to figure out what Connecticut's role as a state is going to be in this. Um, because we can make an argument that if you expand the market in X place to those surrounding communities, it sort of all hangs together. But you get to other places in the state and they're still struggling with basic cell service. Honest to God, it's true. In the northwest corner of the state, they're struggling with basic cell service. So the state's going to have to decide if we have a commitment to every resident of the state, every business of the state, no matter where they're located, what's our role as a backstop to these kinds of projects or something else to incentivize the creation so that Salisbury as well, Lakeville as well, can participate in any economic recovery that's tied uh, to big data. Um, data centers are worth a mention here um, as well. Um, if you build it, they will come, um, and they are big energy eaters, and we know that too, but they bring with them uh, lots of... Uh, related benefit and rings around their presence and something we need uh, to look at and very uh, limited impact on things like traffic uh, and the like. So uh, it comes down to the basic questions. Can we work together? Uh, I'm not so uh, sure of myself on any given day that I think I know the way forward, but I think there's something here and it needs refinement, but that only happens when we enter a dialogue uh, together. We need to collaborate on it. Um, we can be innovative. You know, someone said when we first started to roll this out, do we really need faster kitten videos? And I was like, dude, you completely missed the point. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's not even about the kid necessarily who's trying to do their homework at home, but in some communities it is about that child. Um, it, it's about who are we as a people and who are we going to be in this next reinvention of ourselves as a people. We're in that moment of reinvention now. We are on our hands and knees. We are stubbornly <laughs> unable to get up at this point because of economic conditions, some outside of our control, some that are of our own making. Uh, but we have gotta be planning, even while we're pinned, we've gotta plan for what we're gonna do as soon as we're released um, and make life better uh, for all of our uh, residents. So, um, oh, just I already hit the last couple without meaning to. I went out of order, but uh, with that, I'll close and say I thank you for your time. I thank you. I thank the COG uh, for your partnership in all of this and other issues as well. Um, we do have a lot of challenges, uh, but I know that we can resolve them if we work together. And thank you very much. Still people here? Come on. So. Listen, if we delivered any message today, it's about connectivity. I hope, um, as the mayor said in the opening speech earlier this morning, uh, transportation, technology, transit, uh, and skills. Um, the COG will hold uh, future sessions, uh, focus groups on, on these individual aspects and additional plans, uh, additional corridors, uh, and other, other activities that we're going to be taking up. But it's about adaptation. It's about connectivity. Uh, it's about making public investments. Um, and I, I can't stress enough, building the on-ramps to this gigabit infrastructure is very important. Uh, Kevin said it, it really falls on municipalities. And given the way Connecticut is structured, it's highly unlikely most municipalities are going to be able to make that investment. The state may take it on. I think the number kicked around is like $100 million. Um, but I think for the Naugatuck Valley region, if we want to take advantage of the position we have now in advanced manufacturing, where we are in the state and how we're connected to other regions, um, we need to build that regional on-ramp. Uh, it was interesting, the governor's uh, transportation finance panel, uh, deep in the report, one of the recommendations is empowering municipalities and uh, it talks about a local option revenue source. Um, it's interesting because something like that would allow a region to build and finance a system like this uh, to all consumers and to all businesses. Um, developers could then build flex space, incubator space. Um, we're not talking about trying to attract the big businesses who are going to relocate their entire manufacturing operation here right away. We're talking about startups, the small businesses, the people who experiment with technology and develop the next technologies. Those are the ones we're looking for. 
Um, I'll wrap up. Uh, I really need to extend a thanks to, to my staff at the COG. Um, I don't want to uh, single people out because inevitably I will leave people out, but I will thank one person who did a phenomenal job for this, uh, Aaron Boudris, who put together all the slides and made every other person's slides work in, uh, in concert. Yes, he did a great job and it was a great help to us. Uh, I don't think it would have come together without that. Uh, as I said, uh, all of the presentations will be available on our website. Uh, after the session, uh, nvcogct.org, nvcogct.org. There's a link for the conference there. And uh, as well, uh, hopefully most of it is on CTN as well. So uh, with that, I thank you all for hanging with us. You know, we thought we were going to have 50 or 60 people for this entire conference. We were out in the hallway originally and uh, in the lobby. We had to move inside because we had such a great response. I'm glad you all could stay with us through the entire thing, and I appreciate you all coming. Thank you all very much. <laughs>